Well, hello, friends, and welcome to Friday, and welcome to the last month of the year. That's right, it's December. I don't know about you, but it seemed like it just, I mean, it got here. Uh, and I know as I get older, the years go by quicker. And I know some of you are saying you had not seen nothing yet, and I can't wait to find out, by the way. But we're starting into the book of Revelation. Brother David got us in here yesterday. I'm getting us today into the letters to the churches. And I tell you, instead of a certain letter I want to focus in on, instead I want us to look at each introduction. And of course, in your personal in your quiet time, go back and read each letter carefully, uh, examining what our Lord identified and how he responded to that and how he demanded that the church respond to that. But notice a couple of things about the introduction to each of the letters. Look first of all in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 2. Write to the angel of the church in Ephesus, thus says the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks among the golden camps, uh, golden lampstands, I know your works, I know. So notice that in that particular introduction, we have this phrase, the one who, the one who. And then at verse 2, I know. Now, what's fascinating is, is that clearly the one who is demonstrating the sovereign Lord, his power in and over his church and then the word I know is demonstrating that this is not some this is not knowledge that Jesus has progressively gained over a certain period of time. Instead, this is a knowledge that he perfectly has regarding every aspect of his church. In fact, he comes back a little later in verse 3 says, I know. Now, we skip down now to verse 8. Write to the angel of the church at Smyrna. Thus says the first and the last one, the one who was dead and came to life. I know. So here we are, reminded yet again that this is the sovereign Lord. He is even so he's sovereign over death. And yet again, he has exhaustive knowledge of his church. He knows everything that's going on. He knows the turmoil that they're experiencing, the hardship that they're facing. He says, I know what you're dealing with. Uh, it's not, it didn't catch him by surprise. Again, we come down to verse 6 to, uh, 12. Write to the angel of the church in Pergamum. Thus says the one who has the sharp double-edged sword. I know. So, so, so what I'm trying to stress, friends, and of course we got one more time in verse 18. Write to the angel of the church at Theatira. Thus says the Son of God, the one whose eyes are like a fiery flame and whose feet are like fine bronze. I know. Again in verse 13, 19, I know. All that he, our Lord has exhaustive knowledge. And of course in this case he's referring to himself as the sovereign judge of all things. He says, I am the one whose eyes perceive all things and look beyond any falsehoods or any facades. I see the reality of what is, the truth of what is. I am the judge of this. I am executing judgment about this. I know. I know your works. I know. And this is a reminder that when it comes to being the church, uh, yeah, we have leaders in our church. Yeah, we have uh, certain positions we hold in our church. Yeah, there are certain activities we undertake in the church. All these things we are doing but the fact of the matter is, the sovereign Lord of the universe, he is the head of his church. There is no one above him nor beside him. And he is the all-knowing ruler of his church. He's the all-knowing judge in his church. He's the all-knowing uh, protector and perfecter of his church. And so therefore, when we read these letters, it should lead us, first of all, to a state of, of humility. And remembering that, you know, your pastor, I, I'm not the leader of the church. Christ is. I'm his under-shepherd. He is the leader of the church, and I seek to humbly submit and, and be in obedience to his will for this church, for First Baptist Church. And the same is true for any pastor and, and any group of believers that come together to constitute a church. Yeah, he is the head. He is sovereign. He is the all-knowing ruler of his church. And if we think for a second that there are things that happen in this church that he doesn't know about, think again. And if we think for a second that there may be sins that are harbored by this church that he's not going to judge, think again. And if we think for a second that we come into a season of hardship and he's not aware of that hardship and he's not present in that hardship, think again. Every single letter is a reminder that he is the one, the one and only head of his church, the sovereign ruler of the universe, and he knows. And you know what? That's not only true for the church, that's true for you individually as a believer. He is now Lord of your life. If you are a born-again believer, then you would have had to have surrendered your life to his lordship. He has total authority over your life, in and over your life. And he knows. He knows everything about you. He's not progressively learning who you are. He knows you perfectly. He knows where you excel. He knows where you fail. 
He knows where you thrive. He knows where you're just barely surviving. He knows everything about you. And you know what? He loves you. And where you're failing, he disciplines. Where you're thriving, he supports. And in some cases, even causes that to excel even the more. He gives us exactly what we need, exactly when we need it. And so as you're reading Revelation chapter 2 today, I really want you to notice that about each letter. That the one who knows and the one who has authority over and in and over his church is doing exactly what needs to be done in the church, when it needs to be done, the way it needs to be done for his glory and the continued growth and good of his church. And you know what? We should rejoice in that. We should be glad that what we do is not dependent upon any human being. It's solely rooted in who Christ is and what he's working out in his leaders in his church. And, and I am one of those. Yes, I am. We have our church council, a body of elders that are gathered together. We constantly seek the face of God. We continually seek wisdom from God to pursue his will. You know, we have so many uh, uh, areas of leadership that are in tune with the will of God. So when you read these verses, rejoice, be glad, and be thankful that the Lord has not abandoned his church. He has not just simply surrendered his church to, to the ebb and flow of culture and, and various uh, personalities. No, 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 no. He is still very much present and powerful in his church. He is, the, he is the primary ruler in his church, and he will accomplish his purpose in and through his church. And I'll tell you one purpose is that we come together corporately for the praise and the, the celebration of who he is and what he's doing. And you know what, friends? When we set that up, when we treat that as an option, guess what? It becomes just that, an option. And oftentimes, there'll be other priorities that come into our life that we feel like supersede the option of worship. Stop treating worship, stop treating corporate worship like an option. Stop treating it like an add-on. Small group is good, but we must gather together for corporate worship to encourage one another, to celebrate Jesus, to, to, to be edified, to use an old term, in his, by his word. Worship is not an option, it is the priority. So make it the priority. Now, today, start today. Go ahead and set it as priority, commit to it, and then do not let anything Get in the way of that commitment. And I'll tell you what, friends. You will be blessed. You will be blessed as we come together to pour into one another what we've so richly experienced all throughout the weekend personal worship. We'll pour into one another. This coming Sunday will be Vision Sunday. We'll be looking toward where we feel our Lord is leading us in 2024. We'll talk about our theme. We'll talk about some of the challenges that we're going to issue in 2024. It really is a great Sunday to see you together, gathered, gathered, gathered corporately as a church. So make that commitment now. Make it a priority. And I'm looking forward to seeing you Sunday morning at 830 or 11 o'clock. Until we're together, my friends, live sent.